This is a Havel H6, but this is different I hear you say. That doesn't look like the one you drove a few months ago. <laughs> That's because it's different. This is the H6 GT. What's different about the GT? Well, it's got a completely different front end. It's got a completely different back end. It's a coupe crossover kind of thing. It's like an X4 or a GLC or a Q5 Sportback. We're gonna find out if that makes the brand cool. Before we get going on the Havel H6 GT, can I ask you, if you haven't already, hit subscribe. If you like this video, make sure you hit like and get down telling us in the comments what you think about what I've said or what you think about this car. Now, we're gonna talk about all the things we normally talk about in these reviews. We're gonna talk about how it looks, what you get for your money, how much it costs, how big's the boot. We're gonna talk about the warranty, how much safety gear, and of course, what is this car like to drive? <sighs> ah, that was easy. Let's get going. The Havel H6 GT is a five-door mid-size SUV with a coupe roofline. Based on the H6 SUV, it has a two-litre turbo engine, a stack of equipment, luxury-focused interior, and it's only one of two in this part of the market, the other being the weird Renault Arcana. But the most obvious comparison is the Q5 SUV and Q5 Sportback. With a 150 kilowatt 2 litre turbo engine and all wheel drive, Havel's having a crack where few others have dared to tread, at least not under 80 grand. The designers went to town here with a big black grille, LED headlights, a badge so big it could be a number plate, and lots of black bits all over the car. Along the side here, there's this skirt with one of the weirdest aero devices I've seen in a while. Then you've got the wing up here, which is pretty big, deeper rear bumper, and quad exhaust hidden behind the fake ones. As we'll find out a bit later, these exhausts actually make a bit of noise. Now I guess you're wondering why Havel has made this car. I have a theory. Back in the mid 90s, Hyundai was in kind of the same place that Havel is. Who are they? What are they doing? Why are they, you know, who are these people? So in the mid 90s, Hyundai made this car called the Hyundai Coupe. It was a bolt from the blue. It was very cool looking. My editor Jez reckons it looked like a Taurus, but he's wrong. It looked fantastic. It was just, it was chunky. It looked great. It had a bit of possibly Porsche involvement in making it handle. It was all about getting the brand out there and going, look at what we can do. This is cool. Now in 2022, sports coupes aren't the kind of halo thing that they used to be. So people are doing crossover coupes like this, like the X4, like all the cars we talked about before. So this is their Hyundai Coupe. The H6 GT comes in two flavours. You can get the Lux, which is front wheel drive, and it's only 40,990 drive away. Or you can get this one. This is the ultra all wheel drive two litre turbo for 46,490 drive away. The standard H6 has a massive claimed 600 litre boot. Now, I don't remember the boot seeming that big when I last saw it, but that's what they say. But when you cut the roof line out like they have here for the GT, you are gonna lose quite a bit of space. And in this case, it loses 208 liters, which means it is a 392 liter boot. Looking at it though, it seems bigger than that. So I don't know what's going on with the figures. Under the floor here, you have the space saver spare and you can also store the cargo cover, which is why it's not there now. And when you put the seats down, you do claw some of that space back compared to the SUV with 1392 liters, plays 1485 in the SUV. So yeah, you get those looks, you do lose a bit of space. Here in the back, it's very similar to the SUV. All you really lose is just a little bit of headroom. Whereas in the SUV, I could put a coffee cup on my head and I still had clearance. That couldn't happen in this car and I can't show it to you because Jez hasn't had this car before me and put a coffee cup in it. Oh, did I say Jez? Anyway, so, uh, what have you got back here? Well, you got these seats, which are made of fake leather, nothing wrong with that, with a bit of perforated kind of sporty look in the middle, and this really cool GT embroidery in the micro suede, which I quite like. Um, you've got armrest, cup holders, they'll take normal size cups, no problem. Uh, no bottle holders in the doors, which is a bit of a drag. Um, but yeah, some more of the suede here on the armrest, and uh, the only bits of hard plastic you'll find in this car are basically here and in the door cards. Uh, apart from that, the materials are all really, really quite nice. As you can probably see, tons of room. I am sitting behind where I drive. I'm just under six feet tall. I've got heaps of knee room. I've got foot room. 
it's really very, very spacious. This is probably one of the biggest cabins in a midsize SUV, whether it's the GT or the SUV. It's massive, really, really good for the back seat. The floor is almost completely flat as well. So the middle passenger, who's not gonna enjoy it as much as the outboard passengers, but the middle passenger can actually get their feet in comfortably. And you could almost get three adults across the back of this comfortably because of that flat floor. You've also got two USB ports here to charge your devices. They're USB-A and you've got air vents, but no separate controls. This is a pretty good back seat. Up front, virtually identical to the SUV, apart from some really nice changes in materials. Under your arm here, bit of the suede, very nice. There's this kind of, well, it's fake carbon fiber weave look, but it actually looks all right. I don't mind it. And that's also been added to this, um, stacked effect here on the dashboard. I quite like the design of this car. I think it's really well done. Uh, more micro suede here, more of the, the weave. It's, it's quite a nice subtle kind of change to the, the standard car, but you, you know you're in the GT because of that. And again, you've got the, the GT embroidered into the micro suede on the seats. The seats themselves, look, they're reasonably comfortable. They're not grabby sports seats but really that's not that kind of car. It's not the way you drive it, um, but they look good and they're pretty comfortable. They look a bit flat, but they're more supportive than they look. So I'm not sure about this steering wheel. It, it is better than the Jollyon in that it's the same wheel, but it is able to both adjust for reach and rake, where it only adjusts for rake in the Jollyon, but the aw awkward angle, it, you're just never quite comfortable. I've always felt like my wrists are, are not, natural feeling so it leads to bad habits where you hold the wheel like that uh, it, the angle's just not quite right and that has this knock-on effect of the driving position never feeling quite comfortable for me it might just be me it might happen to you but it is something to think about here in the gt you get these nice paddles which look like metal and and might actually be metal there's some really nice detailing around but you do get some good storage as well you've got a good size glove box there you've got yeah, about three litres of storage under there. You've got this clever little flicky thing for the cup holders where you can have the cup holders active or push it down and you can put a phone in or whatever. Another little slot there, which is another good spot for a phone. Under here, you have wireless charging mat here like this. Um, and as you can see, phones fit quite happily in these other spots. And I almost forgot this clever storage section under here, which is quite large. I discovered the other evening that it's a very good place to put yogurt and fruit that you've bought from the shops. Now, it might have wireless charging, but it does not have wireless Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. That's okay, except, and this might just be because I'm in and out of cars a lot, but the USB port for getting it onto the screen is over here. And this USB port around here only does charging and there's also the 12 volt there as well which would actually get you in the leg when you were driving so that's not going to be much use so it's it's one of those rare moments where they haven't flipped it around for right hand drive and that just makes it feel like come on guys you could have done that anyway there's less of that in this car than there is in the Jollyon. this screen's lovely it's so big and it's crisp and the colors are really nice it's a really nice piece of hardware it's pretty snappy it's just that everything's in it. So you can see a row of buttons here. They're just for things like turning on and off the air conditioning, uh, the hazards and the demisters. But things like air conditioning recircle, which you do need when you're in the city, you've got to go into the menus and find it. And it's actually a bit of a faff. Um, same with the seat heating and ventilation. So it's great that it's got heated seats and ventilated seats. I mean, this car is stacked with stuff but you've got to go digging into the menus for it. And that's kind of distracting while you're driving. The software itself is pretty good. It works pretty well. It's pretty snappy. You've got your mode selection in here, which is reasonably easy to get to. But again, that's the kind of thing you want a physical button for. There's only volume control either on the wheel or in the screen. And if you're in say Apple CarPlay, you've then got to get out of Apple CarPlay to change that if you're the passenger or if you're here on the driver's seat, you've got to use this. So there's just some little ergonomic kind of, not failures, just misses in the way the screen has got everything crammed into it. So when you have everything in the screen, you just want a better way of getting to things rather than having to dive down through the menus to find things. It's, it's something that you'll get used to, but it's, 
it could be less annoying. That's probably the best way to describe it. Digital Dash is really good. It's very, it's unusual in the way it's laid out. It's got this kind of, like right now I'm looking at a revolving image of the earth. <laughs> Why not, right? Who cares? It's kind of cool. Uh, there's a lot going on on there. Some of the script is a little small, which is a little bit annoying. Uh, you, you kind of have to get used to the fact that everything's a bit small. But there's a lot of information here. And again, unlike the Jolyon, you can actually get the fuel economy out of it. Uh, and you can actually see it here on the screen. So while it's a little bit hit and miss, it's much more hit than miss. Just like the SUV version, the H6 GT has seven airbags. The seventh airbag is a front centre airbag to stop you from having head clashes in a side impact. It's also got forward AEB with cyclist and pedestrian detection. It's got reverse cross traffic alert. That's my favourite, as you know. Lane departure warning, lake camp assist, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It scored five ANCAP stars in 2021. And if I've missed anything, the full detail will be in Andy's written review on the website. The link is in the description. The GT is powered by a two litre four cylinder engine developing 150 kilowatts and 320 newton metres of torque. All that power goes to all four wheels via a Haldex all wheel drive system. That'll excite some people in the comments, I'm sure. And it goes through a seven speed twin clutch transmission. Havel reckons you'll get about 8.4 litres per 100 k's on the combined cycle. My colleague Andy, who did admit to having a bit of fun, got 12 and I've got 10. So that seems about right. Havel offers a seven year unlimited kilometre warranty along with five years roadside assist. That warranty length is up there with Kia's and beaten only by Mitsubishi's 10 year 150,000 kilometre warranty. You can prepay your servicing. You can pay for three years for $800 or five years for $1,490. There's a slightly strange thing about the Havel though. It does have a 12 month 10,000 kilometre service interval for the first service and then after that it's 12 months 15,000. Okay, let's get the less good stuff out of the way. It is no secret, well it shouldn't be anyway, uh, that the seven speed gearbox in the Havels is not great. It's quite clunky, it's uh, hesitant, it doesn't always want to change, it sometimes changes when you don't want it to. In auto mode, it can be a little bit, it's pretty ordinary. And there's a bit of rollback uh, when you're reversing into things, it just, it's, just needs some work. It kind of feels like twin clutches did sort of 10 years ago when they were fairly new. Just not great. Um, so there needs to be a bit more polish and a bit more thinking around how the clutches engage. Uh, in normal mode, it's just, it's really, it's hard to predict and it takes forever to wake up from when you've been stopped at the lights and the stop starts kicked in. And I, I'm not one of those people who turns off the stop start, but I did in this car. It's really annoying. There's also a very comprehensive safety package, which is good, big tick on that. Plenty of good safety stuff, but it is a little bit frantic, particularly the ELK, which is the emergency lane keeping system. Uh, and it is constantly dinging and doodling at you in traffic. And it's really annoying because it's too much and you start to ignore it and you either switch it off, which I did, or it just drives you mad because it's, you know, you, you might be on the phone to someone or you might be trying to listen to something and it's just always warning you through the dashboard that you're exiting your lane when you're not. That's the main thing. So lots of false positives from that. The other systems seem to work pretty well. It's just that lane keeping one isn't great. Although the, the forward collision warning sometimes can also give you a bit of a fright, which is, you know, just kind of gives you a bit of a shout that, you, that you're too close to something or about to hit something. Aside from that, you do have quite a decent chassis underneath you in this car. The ride is pretty good. You've got Michelin Primacy tires, so they haven't gone nuts and fitted a set of, you know, Michelin Pilot Sport 4 or 4S's or something like that, which are quite sticky. Uh, but it's a nice mid-spec tyre that really does a nice job of, of maintaining the ride quality, even though the, the body control is a little wayward. The body does move around quite a bit, both vertically and uh, swaying in corners. And that can be, I think on a long trip that might get a little bit much, but when you 
switch out of normal mode, which is just too dense for words. It, you, you have no fun in normal mode. When you pop it into sport, or even better, race, which unleashes <laughs> quite an exhaust note. There's actually four exhausts back there. And it looks like when you switch into sport, it switches to the bigger of the exhaust. And you can't see the exhaust unless you get down on your hands and knees and look under the car. You can see there's a small pair, like one out of each side of the, the muffler, and then two big ones, like quite big ones. And it really does make quite a lot of noise. It's kind of cool. It was kind of unexpected too, because Havel doesn't really strike me as that kind of company where there's some hoons in charge. The steering's pretty good, it, it's very good around town, it's quite light, it's not very communicative, but it tells you enough of what's going on that means you can have a bit of fun. Um, but really, just driving around town, if you put it in sport, that'll be right. It won't, it won't be constantly cutting out, the gearbox won't be messing you around. Because when you're in race, the throttle response is actually quite crisp. <laughs> you don't need much throttle at all, and the car kind of surges forward. It's not a particularly quick car, it's 1700 kilos or thereabouts with 150 kilowatts and 320 newton meters, which, you know, when you put the weight together with the power, isn't a lot, but it gets along quite nicely. The torque comes in very well, the power's up the top of the rev range, so you get to rev the car out a bit. It's a good laugh. It doesn't, it certainly doesn't feel like there's much more work to do to make this car feel kind of properly tied down and, and, and really a really strong contender for you know what is a very small part of the segment but you know there's a lot of quality in the mid-size SUV segment and this is getting close to that it's really really good I mean you know it's, it's well built it's got a lot of stuff it's got all those things but once Havel nails down how to do the gearbox properly how to just take the slack out of the ride this is gonna be a really good car I reckon Havel knew people saw them as a little bit boring, and to be honest, the Jolyon and the H6, they're pretty dull. Overseas, they have names like Big Dog, but that doesn't make the cars interesting, it just makes the name interesting. The H6 GT, it injects a bit of cool. It's got that coupe roof line, it looks aggro, it makes a bit of noise, and actually, once you've pressed a few buttons, it's not bad to drive at all. Has this done the job that the coupe did for Hyundai? Absolutely, it's injected a bit of cool into the brand. The H6 GT is powered by a two litre, how many cylinders? Probably four. I stumbled on that and that's gonna look really bad. <laughs> and for a little while, 